you got your Bibles, you invite us to turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. As you make your way there, we'll return to the Lord once again in prayer. So God, we come to you tonight. We're so grateful and thankful for the opportunity that we have to be here tonight. It's time of fellowship and praise and worship and of prayer and of looking to your word and of learning of you. God, we thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity. Please help us that we might make the most of it. Help us that we might be alert and attentive, uh, that we would hear what it is that you would have to say. Uh, we grow in your spirit and your word, have, have a greater understanding of you, and we thank you so much for the, the, the specific scriptures that we look to tonight, uh, that, that we might grow in our understanding, uh, that, that we could come to a place to realize that it is not just some religion that, it, that, we're, that we believe in, and it's not just like the other ones. Uh, it's not just some old book, it's not just some old system of morals or beliefs, but uh, but one with great substance, one that uh, you have you you yourself have verified openly before the world that there could be no denying of the truth that we could understand uh, with such a, a a firm foundation to believe in uh, that that would come with, with the firm promises that that yeah, that God offers to us primarily that, that we have overcome the world uh, that those commandments would not be grievous but that by your Spirit that we grow in your uh, and. and begin to uh, be used to produce fruit, uh, that you produce your fruit in us, and we might bear it. We're just so thankful that we could be used that way. For those who are here lost, help them that they would uh, see a need to trust you, that they can understand, again, just that firm foundation that you are, that that, that cornerstone, uh, that, 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 that precious cornerstone that has been chosen, uh, that they must be built upon, that they could realize that there is uh, just such a, a good and, and, and firm Savior that they might believe in, uh, that, that, that you have not told them a lie, that you're very trustworthy, that they could see that without you that they have nothing, that, that they have absolutely nothing at all to look forward to, that they actually would stand condemned, that they're condemned already, uh, that they might be redeemed. Please help them to see the simplicity of your gospel, the, 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 the simplicity of faith, and the great power of your grace. Tell me as I was saying that I would not do anything of my own accord, uh, that, that I, I, I would have no desire to arrest my own abilities, and to know that I'd have none to rest on, uh, but by the working of the Holy Spirit, that I could be used to accomplish your purpose. It's in your wonderful hand that we pray for you, so worthy. Amen. First John chapter 5. Uh, we, we covered most of verse 6 last week, had the intention of, of covering the latter part of it. I think, I'm, I'm honestly quite thankful that we, we didn't get to it. There was uh, a lot in this little statement that we'll look at tonight that, that I, I wanted to get to, but I didn't even have covered in my notes for last week. I just knew that there was no time, so uh, the Lord saw fit that, that we could spend a, a whole night on it. There, there's a whole lot to unpack there, uh, but to, to make better our understanding of verse 6, we'll, we'll read verse 5 to get the context. That he would say, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. So stop reading here. Last week we looked at those statements speaking of the water and of the blood, and how uh, there are different ideas on it. But the one that seems to make the most sense, given the context, that we're speaking of uh, of that one that we are believing in. We are speaking of the testimony of that Christ. And so whenever he would make mention of uh, water and the blood, and we look back at that baptism, where God the Father openly, uh, before all, that he would declare, this is my son. Uh, it was before a whole group that they all heard that, that this voice coming out of heaven, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. That at the baptism of Christ, that God testified God himself testified that this is the Son of God. Uh, we spoke a month, really a year ago, on the testimony of these disciples, how that these men were testifying. But here we come to God's testimony, this is my Son. And we, we read the account of his crucifixion, and how that after the fact, uh, that just after Christ had died, that the centurion and all those that were around made the statement, surely this was the Son of God. 
And that they would make that statement because of all the things that God did at the crucifixion. You recall uh, that the veil of the temple was torn, that there was the earthquake, that there was the, the three hours of darkness in the middle of the day, that there were those that were dead, those saints that had died, that were risen from the dead and went into the town and appeared before many. And there was a lot of very strange things going on that clearly God testified to mankind, this is my son. But that was his son that went into the ministry. That was still his, the son of God that was crucified. And so that is, is what he gets at here whenever he's saying, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit. And, and, and so that is where we left off when we come into this next statement. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is true. Uh, that, that it would not just be the father that would testify the deity of Christ. It would be the Spirit. When we speak of this Trinity, the, the Son, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, that it, it, the Holy Spirit also, that is just as much God, I, now I understand that whenever we speak of the, the Trinity, we often rank them just as I have said them, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that we often think of them almost in that order, that we may even think of the Father and the Son as equal, but uh, we kind of just tack the Spirit on there, that the Spirit is just as much God as the Father is God. Uh, that, that it is very important that the Spirit, too, would testify of the deity of Christ, and he has. And so we'll spend some time tonight looking how that the, how that the Holy Spirit bears witness that Jesus is the Son of God. That to, to begin with, the Spirit, uh, he, he bears record through the Word of God. Uh, that whenever we look to the Word of God... Uh, we often, we, we call it God's Word. Uh, we say it's the inf infallible, it is God breathed, that we use all sorts of descriptions uh, or all sorts of ways of describing this Word. And, and, and we, we picture it as this Word that God has given us, and it is. Uh, but that the Word of God is a production of the Holy Spirit. That is how the Word is written. It is, oh, I, I guess it's really a production of, of the Trinity in its entirety, that we see the Trinity everywhere. Uh, that it would be of the will of the Father that we would have the Scriptures. It would be the will of the Father, the contents within the Scriptures. It is His sovereignty. And, and we find the works of the, the Son all throughout the Scriptures, but the Holy Spirit would use mankind to pen these words. The Spirit testifies all throughout the Word of God that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. That we turn to the book of Luke, chapter 24, and we'll see it very plainly here. Luke, chapter 24. Luke, chapter 24. Begin reading in verse 25. Luke chapter 24, verse 25. Then, say, then said he unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, and all and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in the, all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And if we go on down to verse 44, saying, He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Now, that, and to look at the, the very, this is the very end of the book of Luke. And what he he's speaking to these two men that, that were on the roadside, that they were very sad. And Christ being resurrected and not really uh, yet making his, his full appearance, there were those that, was, that still thought they were dead, that he would 
looked to them and asked them in verse 17, what manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And in other words, he sees these two men and says, why is it that you're so sad? And one of them answers and says, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? Do you not realize what's going on that Jesus of Nazareth is dead? Now, we were expecting him to be this Messiah, that, that we thought he was this promised uh, uh, anointed one from God that was coming to establish his kingdom. And that we, we thought a, a whole lot of him, and now he's dead. And Jesus' response is what we read in verse 25, where he said, Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And he helps them to understand that the things that unfolded were exactly what was said. That everything from start to finish in Jesus' life, uh, this carpenter uh, born in the household of Joseph, whose mother was Mary, every detail of this man's life was previously recorded before he ever lived. That it was, that's why he would say, say in verse 26, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered his glory? And in, in verse 27, it really shows the fullness, uh, I guess the, the full scope of, of how impressive it is that all of these things could be fulfilled in one man. In verse 27, he says, in beginning at Moses, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and all the prophets, well, that doesn't leave out any prophets. It says, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And if you think I'm all winded, by the time he got done, it was dark. And that's what they would go on to say uh, at the end. It's the, the day spent on to come with us. But it, it, he took, and, and all the scriptures explain himself looking back saying I fulfilled this was fulfilled in me this was fulfilled in me this was fulfilled in me and that clearly this is overwhelming testimony from the Holy Spirit that this man was the Son of God we, we, we we've looked at something if you if you get time go and read the, the first chapters I think of the book of Matthew uh, that almost after every section that it, it, it makes a statement somewhere along the lines of of, 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 of pointing out this was done to fulfill the scriptures, that he was uh, born of a virgin. This is actually something that would have to be done to fulfill the scriptures, and, and I make mention of that, that you can look and go all the way back to the garden and, and, and see that there was this promise that the seed of Eve would bruise the serpent's head. And we understand in the book of Romans that, that, every, that, that death passed from Adam on, that, that everyone that was born of, of man was born with a sinful nature because Adam had sinned. And, and so there's this one that has to be the seed of a woman and yet cannot be the seed of a man because then he would inherit the, uh, the sinful nature. And so that he would have to be born of a virgin. And, and he was. Uh, that he would have to be born in the tribe of Judah. There's a lot of options. There's 12 different tribes. And he was born in the tribe of Judah. He was born in the city of Bethlehem, which was not a very big city. Uh, that, that he would be caught, that there was prophecy saying that this Messiah would be called out of, uh, out of Egypt. And as Herod would pursue his life, that uh, he, they would flee to Egypt and a couple of years later come out of Egypt. Uh, that he would be called a Nazarene. That he would be of Nazareth. And, that he, he, and, and that's exactly where he grew up. Uh, that his life would be soft. And that if you were to, to tell a prophecy, and it sounds very incoherent to begin with, it sounds very contradictory to say to speak of one who was born in Bethlehem, who would be from Nazareth, who would come out of Egypt. And you're saying, well, that's three totally different locations. And you read the book of Matthew, how, how easily those all live in harmony with one another. Well, they lived in Nazareth, and they had to go to Bethlehem to... Uh, pay their taxes to, to perform uh, 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 the census. And he would be born there, and all these things would unfold. Very specific details. And this isn't just your normal horoscopes that you find in a newspaper. These, these are very specific things. All in birth, just screaming of, of, of the fulfillment of the scripture. But in life, that, that there were several things that he, he would do throughout his ministry. 
uh, a couple of things to, to name that we read in the book of Isaiah of that one that would go before him, that voice calling out, out, out from the wilderness, that he would have a forerunner. And John the Baptist was on the scene, and Christ pronounced him that forerunner, and he did exactly what the scriptures foretold would happen. Now, there were these scriptures that foretold that he would minister in Galilee. And he ministered in Galilee, that whenever you look to his death, that there would be the Old Testament scriptures, uh, that you can read the book of Psalms, how that he would be betrayed by a close friend. And he was betrayed by a close friend. That he would be crucified. The book of Psalms details, it doesn't call it crucifixion, but it details crucifixion, which was a form of, 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 of punishment that didn't even exist at the time. And yet the scriptures would speak of how that he would die. And how that he would suffer. That, that even if you look at the law, that, that he, and the, all the different ways that he was a fulfillment of the law in his death, that even to the point of, of, of the judicial law, speaking of one that had committed a crime unto death, that he must be hanged on a tree there between God and man. And that would be, of course, he didn't commit no sin, but that he would take the sin of us all and suffer that fate as one who had. So we see time and time and time and time again of all of these scriptures that were given centuries before this man was ever born, and he fulfilled every single one of them, and including the one of his resurrection. That all of these things, and that as he said in verse 27, beginning at Moses and the, and the prophets, sorry, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself and as he would make mention again in verse 44 these are the things that are spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me and, and we speak of the spirit's testimony of this because that whenever you look to who wrote those books there were men uh, men men wrote them so I already said the first five books of the Bible those were written by Moses. Uh, that you'd go on and we'd find a bunch of psalms written by David. Uh, you'd find a couple books written by Solomon. Uh, you, you'd find different prophecies written by these different prophets. And you look at the authors of these books, speaking of the men, and you find a, a, a very rough group of folks. Again, we look to Moses, who did write those books. And while Moses was a great man, there was much wrong with Moses. So much wrong, in fact, that God would not permit him to enter into the promised land. That, that, that the man Moses was not that impressive. The man Moses was terrified to ever start to begin with. The man Moses was found after he had fled. Uh, there is nothing particularly great about Moses, and yet we're talking about the one who wrote five books of the Bible, and the words of those books will, will outlive time itself. Uh, they, they transcend time. They're eternally true and will always eternally be true. That whenever you look to that man David, we have uh, we have several things that we could point to of all the different ways that, that David went astray. That he wasn't very as far as sinless. He was nowhere even close to what we would call sinless, and yet he wrote so many of the Psalms uh, that again eternally sing, uh, sing the praises of God. A little to Solomon, a man who got caught up in idolatry and, and, and all sorts of wickedness and pursued all sorts of vain pleasures. And yet the words that he wrote are perfect and pure. You look at Isaiah, the prophet who proclaims himself, I'm a man of unclean lips, amongst people of unclean lips. And yet all of these men were used to perfectly record and prophesy of this Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled every bit of it. That this is overwhelmingly the work of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's testimony that that man is who we were, we were looking for. This is a very important concept to, to believe, to grasp, uh, that this is, this is what separates what we believe in from what the rest of the world believes in. This is what separates Christianity from Mormonism. This is what separates Christianity uh, from, from uh, Islam. This is what separates Christianity from Buddhism. This is what separates Christianity from all of them. 
all of them that, that very randomly they have come up with some sort of, of religion. I've used this example before, but the religion of, of Islam, the, the Muslims, so they have have a very prominent religion, a very popular religion uh, that that a large percentage of the world be, follows and believes that system of rules. And all of that stemmed from one man, Muhammad, who come out of the wilderness and said, I've received a word from God. And that was it. Now, whenever you look, if you ever had the pleasure of going out west, it's a very beautiful place to go. And you'll notice one thing. There's a whole lot of Mormon churches there. A ton of them. You'll see such and such Church of Latter-day Saints. And they're everywhere. And that is it's quite, quite literally not, it's not Christianity at all. Uh, they don't believe in the deity of Christ. It, it couldn't be Christianity. And again, another religion that was founded by one man who said, I've received a new revelation from God, and this is what it is. And it just so happens to benefit that man a whole lot to do so. That all of these religions, they, they all kind of start the same way. It's, it's one founder who decided that, that very spontaneously and out of the blue, this is the truth. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus was expected. And I say expected because we have centuries of prophecies, specific prophecies, that all point to one man who has ever fulfilled all of them. He was expected to come. This is the testimony that we have of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. But the Spirit also testifies. Uh, he, he testified, actually, openly. Uh, the Spirit, he, he has testified through Christ in the same manner that the Father has. We spoke about that the Father has openly, verbally proclaimed, This is my Son. That the Spirit has done something very similar. Turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Verse 21. Luke chapter 3, verse 21. It says, Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass... That Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape, like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee am I well pleased. We, we read very similar scriptures last week, looking to the proclamation from the Father, This is my beloved Son. And the book of Matthew records that the Holy Ghost descended on him like a dove, uh, but that, that it may be that you've always pictured that as a dove coming down. That's not what happened. Uh, that like a dove, it's, it's what we, we call a simile. It's just kind of describing the motion. Uh, that in the, the book of Luke actually records an extra detail. That, that it says that the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. That the Holy Spirit manifested himself. And it, again, the Holy Spirit isn't a body, but that he came as a body, manifesting himself as a body, revealing himself to the multitudes there at the baptism of Jesus. I have to imagine the large multitude, there were always large multitudes surrounding John. And so that, that he, he descended openly and visibly the Holy Spirit upon Jesus, anointing him. This is something that is actually often mentioned in scripture that uh, of the actions of Christ and how that they were according to the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is further developed all throughout the book of Luke it, it, it is all throughout the book of Luke as a matter of fact if you turn to Luke chapter 4 after that he is baptized uh, he goes on to give his genealogy and in cha chapter 4 verse 1 it says in Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Go down to verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Gal into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And over, and there's just a couple examples. We find the book of Acts, uh, also written by Luke. 
for just by the way Luke seemed to have a, a keen sense or, or seemed that this was a very important uh, bit of information to include and he includes it over and over and over and over again that this Jesus he is acting according to the Holy Spirit and again uh, one that this is actually the fulfillment of a prophecy as well that he would act in accordance to the Holy Spirit we'll turn and read of that in just a moment but this again is important just as, as we, we talked about that he was expected to come on the scene that we can understand that, that this Jesus he wasn't acting in a very rogue manner he wasn't acting of his own accord he wasn't acting according to his own will but that he was acting in obedience to the will of the Father by the working of the Holy Spirit, showing the Trinity all involved. Now, that there are plenty of folks that have come and professed themselves to be that Messiah. There are some today that, have, that are right now at this moment proclaiming they are the Messiah. There are going to be those that come later on that will openly proclaim themselves to be the Messiah, but every single one of them act according to their own desires. They do things that they want to do. They do things that they come up with. There is one who is actually the Messiah. There is only one that the Holy Spirit has testified of. There's only one that the Father has testified of, and that one is found in Jesus, who ministered in Galilee. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah 61. Keep your spot right here. We'll be right back in Luke chapter 4 in just a moment. But in Isaiah chapter 61, there is a prophecy of that Messiah that we find over here. Isaiah chapter 61. Just one verse. Isaiah 61 and verse 1. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And if we turn to the book of Luke, chapter 4, what we find in verse 18. I quote from Jesus where he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That he, he, in here, that he is reading in the book of Isaiah right here that he is he, he's invited to to uh read in the tabernacle or in the temple and he if you go up to verse 17 that it was delivered in the book of the prophet Isaiah or isaiah and so he reads this and in verse 20 he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began to say unto them this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? That, that if, if, as we go back to the, the development of this, of, of this idea of him acting according to the will of, of the Holy Spirit, that him acting according to the Holy Spirit, being full of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, that in that prophecy, that he would make mention of one who is anointed to preach the God, that he is anointed, that he is that anointed one, and that anointing came by way of the Holy Spirit, on to Jesus, and he here proclaims, this prophecy is fulfilled today in your ears, that he is him, uh, that Jesus is that one, that the, and the Father has confirmed it, the Spirit has confirmed it, that he has declared that this man was God, who was anointed for this redemptive work of the Messiah. And that is exactly what he was anointed for. This too is important. Because the ones that the scriptures proclaim, the one that the Father has sent, that he must be doing redemptive work. He must be restoring mankind back to God. That was his purpose. And that is precisely what he did according to the Spirit. Turn through to uh, Acts chapter 10.
Acts chapter 10. Verse 34. Acts 10, verse 34. It says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. This, is a, this verse here is a very good summation of what we're talking about. How that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. That is the description of this man from Galilee, this Jesus of Nazareth, that he was anointed, set aside for a purpose, uh, sanctified for one specific use, and that use was to, as he described, by the Holy Ghost with power to do good healing all that were oppressed of the devil. That, that statement, if you, if you paid attention and have a very good memory, because it was a good while back in the book of 1 John, there's a statement in 1 John that is very similar to that, of the work that Jesus did, how he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. If we go back to 1 John and we go to chapter 3, In verse 7, 1 John chapter 3, and verse 7, he would say, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committed sin is of the devil. The devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Again, where we read in Acts chapter 10, that he is doing good and healing all of those oppressed by the devil. Here, John describes him as destroying uh, the, the, the works of the devil. It's, it's essentially the same thing, that this man, very clearly, from every angle that we could possibly look at it from, from a, a, a declared by every source, that that man born at that time had to be the Messiah. That there's no other way. There's also no other way that he could have fulfilled all those prophecies. And they're, they're the, I think I've, I've spoken just if we took a handful of just a handful of the prophecies that he fulfilled. Uh, that that it is essentially, if you were looking at the math and the probability that it could be fulfilled, it basically couldn't. Uh, that, that that is so infinitely small of a chance. And he did it to a T. Every bit of it. That we can rest assured beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is the Christ. And that in that we can have a great confidence that it's not just like one of the other religions. That if you're being honest with yourself, I feel certain that that thought possibly has creeped into your mind at some point. How do I know that this is the right one? That you look around, undoubtedly there's a God. I don't have a problem believing that, that, that creation needs a creator. That, that seems obvious, but there's a whole lot of options to choose from. How do I know that I've chosen the right one? Uh, that I, I just so happened to be born into it. Thank God that I was. But, but how do I know? Well, we can, God answered that question. That it's not just a, oh, just, just believe this book for no good reason. He's given us every reason in the world and testified himself clearly that we have a firm foundation that the church is built on. And that, that can really give us a sense of assurance that we see that, this, that not we saw last week the Father's testimony. But even this week, how the Spirit testifies through his word and how the Spirit testified 
through the actions that Christ did, uh, but that he also continues to testify today. Uh, that he, this very same spirit that worked in Christ, that to, for, for him to do the works that he did, to do the actions that he did, make the decisions that he made, is the very same spirit that worked in all those men in the Old Testament that wrote those words, prophesying of it. And it's the very same spirit that works today to convict the heart, our hearts of the truth and to draw us to himself. It is the very same spirit that if you're here tonight and you are saved that is in you and who is working in you. The most visible record of the Holy Spirit for you as, uh, a, as a believer in Christ is in your life and what he has done with that life. I know this has been something that has constantly come up in, in 1 John, how the, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave the life alone. There is a change that takes place. Uh, I think Romans chapter 8 describes this very well, and we'll, we'll turn and read there and close. I will warn you, it's lengthier reading. Uh, but here in Romans chapter 8, We, we see written out here clearly that the most visible record in the believer, uh, the most visible record of the Holy Spirit in the believer is in the life that that believer lives. And how that he works in us to testify of Christ's work. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. We'll break it down. We'll, we'll end up reading uh, through about verse 17. We'll skip around some, but, but we'll, we'll break it into sections. Beginning in verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. As we look to the working of the Spirit in the life of a believer, that that Spirit sets us free from our captivity. A, a, a visible record, a, a visible testimony of the Holy, that the Holy Spirit gives to us, that the works that Christ has done are true and sufficient and good, is that the Spirit sets us free from our captivity, in our captivity to sin primarily. In, in these first four verses that we've read, he makes mention of the law and the Spirit and the flesh, and it gets a little bit wordy and confusing. But he, he makes mention of the law and what the law could not do. What the law could not do. And, and don't think as though that the law is imperfect. The law is perfect. It was given of God. It is God's instruction. There is nothing wrong with the, with the law. But what the law could not do is redeem us. What the law could not do is forgive us of our sins. What the law could not do is make us transform. Why could the law not do that? It's because the law was never intended to do that. The law was intended to be our schoolmaster, actually, as Paul explains in the book of Romans. It is given to us that, that he, he, he used the example, I would have not known what not to covet had the law not said, thou shalt not covet. That the law comes in and instructs us of our sin. It shows us our sin. The law, what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh because we weren't able to follow it. God did in sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. So the law could not condemn sin. The law could not set us free. The law could not bring us to God because we are weak. Not, not because the law is weak, but because we are weak. We could not follow that law. So what the law could not do, Christ did. He came to this earth, took on our sin, and was uh, actually suffered the wrath of God for it. And in doing that, the righteousness of the law, 
because the law is righteous, it might be fulfilled in us. But it's fulfilled in us not because we did some performance. The, the, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us not because we kept the law perfectly, but because Christ did. And that is then placed onto us. And it then begins to set us free from our sin. That, there, that it is fulfilled in us who now walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That, that the, the working of the Holy Spirit in our life, and the working that Christ did to redeem us, it sets us free from that which we were previously bound to. It's placed a new nature in us. That's actually what he goes on to explain. He, he, he gives us a new character. In verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. So we go on to explain in verse 9. In this section, we see that the Spirit would come and in our life set us free from the captivity of sin. And it does so by giving us a new nature. That he speaks of that carnal mind and the spiritual mind. And how the carnal mind cannot be subject to as, as he says, to the law of God. He says, not only is it that the law, that the, 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 the one who has a carnal mind, it's not just that he's not subject to the law, but it, it can't be. The carnal mind hates the law. The carnal mind loves sin. That there has to be a transformation, a new birth with a new nature to ever even have any desire for the law, to have any desire for righteousness. And that is exactly what takes place the working of the Holy Spirit, that there is a, a transformation in our character and in the things that we want because we've been set free from that old master. All of this is done by the working of the Holy Spirit. Whenever we look to the, the requirement, if you will, for salvation, that in order to receive this, to receive the Holy Spirit, to receive redemption, it's not by you going out and doing something very impressive, it's by believing the works that Christ has done. And so then you can't take any credit for what it produces. Everything that it produces is produced by the Holy Spirit that was given to you. This testifying, again, to the work of Christ. Uh, that it, He goes on, then the, the Holy Spirit communicates our unity with God through his testimony as well. You can skip on out of verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit itself, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That this is the testimony of the Holy Spirit. We see it in us being set free from the one that previously, previously enslaved us, sin. We see it through the changing of our character and the things that we desire now that there is placed within us a desire for righteousness when we previously had no such desire. And that we are now the sons of God. We have been given a, a spirit that in which we are his child, not a spirit of fear. And in all of these things, the Holy Spirit, it says, and, and we kind of summarize very well in verse 16, this, the Holy Spirit, I know it doesn't say Holy Spirit, but that capital S Spirit, that's what it's referring to. The Holy Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit, communicates to our spirit, that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit testifies 
of the deity of Christ over and over and over again. It testifies of Christ again through the words and the prophecies that were fulfilled in him. It testifies of Christ through the actions that Christ did on this earth. It testifies of Christ and, and it's working within us. All of these things give us an overwhelming confidence that the one that we are believing in is the Messiah. That as we go back, I want to remind you of why John is bringing this up. Because speaking previously uh, in verse 3, back in 1 John 5, he would say, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. And he explains why they're not grievous, because whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That he's describing, the, even in, in verse 1, he's describing our love for one another and our love for God. And that our love for God causes us to keep the commandments. And we can do so because we have overcome. And we've overcome because the work of Christ. And we can believe in that work. It's, it's, it's all, it's, it seems as though there's switching subjects over and over and over again. But he's, he's building up to this, uh, th this confidence that we can have here that he make, makes mention of in, in, in verse 6. It's not just some random individual that we place our faith in. I, I don't think I've overcome the world by trusting some random Jew 2,000 years ago. I can know that I have overcome the world because I believe in Jesus Christ, who with overwhelming evidence is the Messiah, and there's no doubt about it. There is no thing that is contradictory within him that could say otherwise. He is a Savior that is well worthy of our trust and one that we can have extreme confidence in. And this extreme confidence is something that he's going to continue to develop in 1 John as, as we go on. Uh, but this will be the message. Walk from verse 7 to